He is worthy of praise. It said all praise. Not just of praise, worthy of praise. It said worthy all praise. Daniel chapter 5, verse 27. Tegel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. This morning we noted the five different ways that Belshazzar was wanting and similar, similar and like him, how lost individuals today are wanting. Number one, they pollute the sacred thing. Number two, they were influenced by outside sources. Number three, they praise false gods. Number four, they do not glorify the true God. And number five, they ignore the influence of godly family. So that was this morning. We discussed those five ways and, and how sinners are found wanting when weighed in the balance. But this evening, it's the saints. How are we found wanting? Heidi had come up with this book. It's all about obedience by Becky Keep with Tim Keep. And the Collinsworth, Kim's Collinsworth, this would be her sister. She was one of the Keatons. And it's one, it's all about obedience, one woman's discovery of a fruitful life in a foreign land. And earlier this week, in a need to find something like to read, I picked this up and started reading it and found it quite convicting. So Thursday I was driving. I had four or five guys I needed to meet, and I guess six, because one, the second guy was the one that was really the important one. That's Danny Williams. We met for lunch and had lunch. And as I was driving, I was thinking kind of about this book and some of the things in it. And the verse come to mind, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. More, more in regard to how Christians themselves are wanting than the lost. It was, I mean, that, was, that really wasn't the whole impetus for my thought process going down that line. But as I read the book in this evening, I know it's probably not kosher and it may be hard to do. I'm going to read things out of her book to fit with how we as Christians can be found wanting. And the first thing, she, I mean, it's not the first thing in the book, it's first on our list, is we hold things in reserve. Jesus said, I want all of you, and yet we hold things in reserve. She had, well, I guess she tells it here. Tim had, well, I'll read that too. So I'll just read it. I'm reading excerpts, so if you want the book, I don't know where Heidi got it, Facebook, maybe through, but through them, but holding in reserve, think of that. Most unsettling of all for me was the deep inner awareness brought about by the Holy Spirit that there was a part of me, a part of my heart and life that I was holding in reserve. I really believed that my greatest desire was to serve, follow, and obey God. And it was deeply disconcerting to realize with that simple phone call that this might not be completely true. The call is when Tim had called her. She was actually vacationing with her mother and dad. And he'd said, I got a call that we can go to the Philippines. And instead of just saying no, she said, why in the world did you have to ruin my vacation? And basically hung up on him. Deeply disconcerting that simple phone call might not be completely true. As I grappled with this, my mind was drawn to another day in my life when I had flashed God a yellow signal. It was in my freshman year of high school. One afternoon I was sitting in a study hall finishing up some homework. I had just come from chapel. My mind was still there mulling over the things that I had heard. It had been a great chapel service. Our speaker had surrendered his whole life to God and had spent many years as a missionary in Bolivia. He had captivated us with create, creatively told stories of God's power, stories of danger, stories of humor. Most importantly, the missionary's love for God was so evident there had been no altar call that I remember, no invitation to surrender one's life to God. It had just been another service, just another day at school. 
But as I sat there quietly reflecting on the things the missionary had said, I suddenly heard the voice of God speaking to my heart. Becky, he spoke gently, what if I called you to be a missionary? I distinctly remember the emphasis being on you. I felt myself drawing back in fearful reticence at the thought and couldn't shake it off. I spent the rest of the study hall unable to concentrate and attempting to convince myself that I really hadn't heard the voice of God. Time goes on, she says, halfway through Tim's freshman year, they're married by now, he came home from class one day with some startling news. Honey, he said, I just can't feel clear about joining the ministerial program. I feel certain that for some reason, God wants me to join the missions department. My heart sank, there it was again, missions. I supported this, Tim in this decision and never let on that the mere word mission caused a tidal wave of anxiety to rise within me. Later, she says, I was delighted when we received an invitation to pastor a small church in Michigan just before Tim graduated. Perhaps this would be God's mission field for us. Going on, she said, after the phone call from Tim, I could no longer push God away. I could no longer ignore his firm yet gentle voice beckoning me to acknowledge his call. I had heard all my life that God's way is the best way and that he would never leave you where his grace cannot keep you. I had been told since infancy by godly parents that my life was not my own, that I had been brought into the world for a purpose, that God had a wonderful work for me to do. I knew that I had been dedicated to God as a tiny baby and that my parents had fully and completely entrusted my life to the Father. Though I understood with perfect clarity the choice that was mine, my mind wrestled with the ramifications. My flesh cried out for comfort, for familiarity, and ease. I knew that yielding to God meant a complete and total relinquishment of every detail of my existence. I would have to embrace, renounce my claim on my rights, my life, my children, my husband, my future. I could follow my husband to the end of the earth, but that would not destroy the hidden barriers of my heart. I was at a crossroad. The crossroad was mine alone. She goes on and tells how she finally yielded. On February 17th of 96, I simply laid down my will and accepted God's plan for my life, our lives. With that decision, a calm restfulness possessed me. With the cessation of war came tranquility, <coughs> contentment, and even a joyful anticipation of the future. With surrender came certainty, certainty that my Heavenly Father would take each step of this dawning journey with me. And she goes on. Holding in reserve. I, it had slipped my mind till I was reading that. About sitting at my desk one day and I, I had come across an article regarding Christians in North Korea. And I printed it off how the church is, is booming underground and in secret and in persecution in North Korea. And about the same time I stumbled onto a prayer list from Riverview. Pray for such and such a family, our missionaries in North Korea. And I don't think I'm called to the mission field in North Korea. But it was, what if I ask you to go there? Or even worse, what if you, I ask your children to go there? Am I holding anything in reserve? Has the Spirit been speaking to you about anything? Put that down. Take that up. Go or stay. Give or keep. If we're holding anything in reserve, we will be found wanting. Holding in reserve. You can have all of me except that. I'll do anything but that, I know a guy that 13 months ago said, I hate Arkansas. But I still was willing to follow the Lord. And where are we? We're in Arkansas. The second thing she tells about, living in fear, not faith. Living in fear, not faith. I'll just paraphrase it instead of read it. She, she was telling about when they got there, 
She was scared about going to begin with all the uncertainties, the no, the, the language barrier and the culture differences and the disease and all the things that would go on. And she got there and immediately after arriving, some Filipino woman came up and grabbed her little boy and did his cheeks like people do. And the mother nurse in her terrified over, that woman could have given my child to birth to TB, to, to say it, to, yeah. Could have given it to him. And all the things that she was fearful of. And time and time and time again, she was scared. And she wasn't living in faith. How much more could we, the, what are there, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, eighteen of us, the dozen and a half of us that are here, how much more could we do for Jesus if we were not afraid? Say, what am I afraid of? Snakes or mice? Big dog? No. Afraid of failure? Or rejection? Or ridicule? What about loss? What about weariness? Do you ever think about, am I afraid of just getting tired and bogged down in the, the grind? And I don't want to start lest I get weary. The cost? You know, there's people that are afraid of the germs, and so they won't do stuff because they're afraid of germs. The work involved. Are we afraid? Afraid of embarrassment? I think I've told it before at Hercules. I started really <coughs> singing out. Not just singing, but on purpose, intentionally singing out. Knowing it was loud and knowing I hit wrong notes occasionally. I hit one this morning and heard it on the, on the, when I was working through it. I just hope nobody else did. But it was during the altar call, so I hopefully y'all were praying and not listening. But the, no one afraid of hitting wrong notes, afraid of embarrassment. I could have done that, but then it dawned on me. I've got a, four nieces and nephews behind me and a row full of kids of my own. And they need somebody maybe to emulate. Somebody that's not, that even if he is afraid, doesn't let on to it, can show some faith. Do we this evening really believe there's a hell? Is there a hell? Is it bad? Do we want to go there? Do we believe there's a heaven? Is it good? Then why don't we do things? Jesus said, go into all the world and teach. Except Benton County, Arkansas. That one you don't need to worry about. Fear or faith? Weighed in the balance this evening, are we wanting are we wanting? We try to talk to the Abels of the world, and we try to talk to the Carolinas of the world, and we try to we try to deal with those around us. And we have faith to a degree. Another area she tells about where Christians might be lacking or wanting is the lack of Pure, true love. Pure love. Love that cleanses annoyances. She tells the story of, of hearing somebody. On an early afternoon in November, I stepped from my kitchen through a screen door onto my back porch and discovered her sitting there. She was dirty, pregnant, and carrying a malnourished looking little boy on her hip. It took me a moment to recover from the shock of finding a complete stranger on my mostly enclosed porch, but I quickly mustered a smile and asked, can I help you? In an expressionless tone, she told me that they were hungry. I left them there and went inside to prepare a bit of something for the two of them to eat. Returning to the porch, I handed her a sandwich and some ramen noodles. To me, that's not love. That's, um, that is abuse to give somebody Raymond noodles. And stood watching in astonishment at the manner in which her little boy devoured it. Without a doubt, this little guy was starving. Thus began my relationship with Jasmine and Mark. 
By December, Jasmine and Mark were showing up every day. Jasmine came, always came at the most inopportune times. Six o'clock in the morning was her favorite time to show up. Her knock on the door could raise the sleeping dead. It was loud and repeated until, fearing that she would awaken our own small children, we'd sleepily throw on some clothes and answer. Honestly, I became irritated with her continual forays into our privacy and even our sleep. She smelled awful. She had a scaly rash that covered her arms, and I had observed bugs crawling in her hair. I cringed at the thought of getting too close, fearing that I might contract a fungus, head lice, or something worse. Really, what is my responsibility here, I often wondered. Must we continue this indefinitely? There must be a limit somewhere. Over and over in my mind, I mulled many justifiable reasons for turning Jasmine and Mark away. But Tim and I both felt compelled by the Holy Spirit to continue meeting their needs. We knew that no matter what time of day or night she chose to come, we were, we were to continue giving without restraint. A question that always tugged at my mind was this. How does Jesus view Jasmine? As I pondered the answer, I became aware of my lack of love. Not only for her, but for the unwanted in this world. I began to pray and ask God to enable me to love this needy woman and child as he loved them. Although I had invited Jasmine to come to church on several occasions, she had always declined saying, I'm Catholic. Two weeks after the birth of her baby, she appeared again on my back porch. This time, she not only asked for food, but for a dress to wear to church. I was surprised and asked her, do you want to come to church with me? Yes, she replied, this Sunday. Jasmine did come to church that Sunday and every Sunday after. I felt so blessed to have her walk to the front of the church with me. She listened with rapt attention to the, when the sermon was delivered. Her visits to my house decreased to maybe once or twice each week. She'd only come to remind me to pick her up for church. It was only after a few Sundays that God's presence came very near as we were singing a beautiful praise chorus that says, At the cross I bow my knee where your blood was shed for me. There's no greater love than this. I glanced at Jasmine and saw tears streaming from her eyes. The knowledge that she was loved seemed to be washing away the fear and distrust by which she had been bound so long. Lord, let it wash away her sins, I prayed. I placed my arm around her and realized that this cold-hearted beggar, who had perhaps never felt a loving touch, heard a kind word, or experienced a compassionate deed, but had endured countless beatings and sexual abuse, was being melted by love. I understood in a moment why we had been constrained for the past five months to patiently give, 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 even when our selfish hearts wanted to send her away. We will never accomplish God's purposes in this world until we learn to love as he loves, until we push past our own boundaries, frustrations, discomforts, and irritations, and love as we have been loved in the rags of our own sin and brokenness. Think of the love Christ has demonstrated toward us. It's incomprehensible to think how far he condescended down, down, down to our pitiful, sinful state. Through Jasmine, I realized just as she was dirty, smelly, unkempt, ungrateful, and even barbaric, this is exactly how we must appear to a holy and righteous God. And yet he loves us. His love breaks through all of our filthiness, failures, unworthiness, and sins, and draws us to himself. How do we love tonight? How do we love our neighbor? Do we love him as ourself? Do we show them the love that we would hope somebody would show us if we became destitute? God forbid, but circumstances arise and I end up on the street. How do I treat that person if I was hungry or needy or requesting something? How do we love? How do we love? Are we found wanting? Love also will endure. It will endure. It will put up with stuff that we just 
inwardly revolt at, but it will endure. This is Tim writing her husband. He said, town fiestas in the Philippines provide days of pagan revelry, including a gay beauty contest. In an attempt to reach out to evangelical Christians, our town mayor offered one night of the fiesta as evangelical night. On evangelical night, all evangelical churches would gather at the town square for a joint worship service with the hope that many of the towns unchurched would hear the gospel. Our first experience with evangelical night didn't go so well for me, but the lesson I would learn would position my heart for a more humble, Christ-like ministry. Now listen close, this, this got to Nathan because I've done what he's done. Hundreds of believers from various denominations were present in the open square that night. Our Shepherd's College faculty and student body were also present, as well as several pastors and congregations within our denomination. As a sign of respect to the Americanos present, our family was given VIP seating on the stage, right in front of two gigantic speakers. When the band got revved up, the music became so loud that I felt my ears would explode. The music was not only loud, but the worship was too long, and I felt the songs most distasteful. To make matters dreadfully irreverent, from my perspective, one of the charismatic churches blessed us with young females who came to the front and performed a worship dance. It was more than my solemn, conservative sensitivities could handle. I was angry. I whispered sternly to Becky to grab the children because we were leaving this irreverent place. So we got up right in the middle of the service, jumped in our van, and headed back toward the campus, a brief three kilometer drive, kilometer drive. On the way, I ran it a bit, but Becky was unusually quiet. I knew that I had embarrassed her. I knew too that her silence was a protest against my attitude. Three kilometers was all the distance the Holy Spirit needed to teach me one of the most powerful lessons I have ever learned. Son, he said in my heart, you acted tonight in self-righteous pride. Now listen close. I didn't call you here to change everything and everyone, to impose your personal standards and agenda, or even to force my principles and standards. I called you first to love people through me and to sincerely care for them. If you don't love them, you'll never be able to help them. There are churches I will not attend because of their irreverent ways. Who is that hurting? God help me. You know, we have, as conservatives, we have standards of, of decency. We have standards of worship. We like tasteful songs and reverent songs and, and songs that, that have meaning and theology and doctrine and There are songs that are sung that I hate and despise, just to say it clearly. And there's songs that are sung that you all don't care for. But are we loving people or are we just self-righteous and proud and a little bit arrogant? God help us. Weigh us. Are we wanting in that area? Do we have true love? Another thing she says is lack of a servant heart. Or time is moving on, but lack of a servant heart. Do we really want the best for another? We go to Chick-fil-A and thank you for this and it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Those people are always so glad to take your money and give you a chicken sandwich. My pleasure. My pleasure. Servant heart. Laying down your rights. Several months ago, it may have been a year now or more, there was an, a situation, an issue where I, I could not seem to get victory over it. I would try to forgive those who might have wronged me. It wasn't intentional. It just was circumstances. And I would try to, try to forgive them. And, and it's like I, I, I never could get it done. Tried to get victory over it. And you know what I actually had to surrender before I ever got victory over that situation? Was my right to an opinion. 
I cannot even have an opinion regarding that situation. Good, bad, indifferent, it doesn't matter. I cannot have an opinion. If you knew me very well, you'd say, that's tough. I've got opinions. Several of them. They're good ones. You ought to share them. They're great opinions. But I had to give up my right to an opinion. Lay down our rights. That's a servant attitude. No longer do I have the right to have it 68 degrees in church because there's old people with thin blood. They want it 70 or 72. No longer do I have the, the right, a servant heart. Do we have a servant's heart? Are we always looking out for the other guy? Always? If we don't, we'll be found wanting. What about patient for a true harvest? Patient for a true harvest. Tim and I believe that love is also patient for the true harvest. Love doesn't press for superficial change. Love gives time for truth principles to penetrate deep into the heart until they are rooted in culture. Tonight we sang, what page was it, 225? He took, 224, he took my sins and my sorrows, made them his very own. True harvest. How many churches will have a kid or a youth camp and they'll say, who wants to make a decision for Christ? Well, everybody would want to do that. And yet they have not been convicted and recognized their condemnation and how rotten they are. They don't know what it's like to, to stand up and to have their sins washed away and to be cleansed and know what peace with God is like. And in our, in our excitement and in our enthusiasm to have people make decisions for Christ, if they don't know what peace with God is like, how will that person ever stand a chance? The Bible says the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep you. And if you never know, how will you know if you're off base? If Johnny went to Shipley's and slipped in when they were closed and stole him a a maple glazed Bavarian filled long john, he would know immediately that he had lost victory for stealing. I may be there in the morning. I resisted temptation yesterday to go by there and get a donut, but I don't know that I can do it twice in a row. Heidi said, let's just go by there and start vacation rides. We may do it. <clears throat> but my point is, if we don't know what peace with God is like, we won't know when we're out of his favor. Patient for a true harvest. To push, push, push somebody to say, I want to follow Jesus without them really being cleansed and convicted. Are we doing a disservice? <laughs> Heidi and I talk about a girl we've known, her no, who got saved and fell away. And Heidi said she'll never be able to deny the peace she had while she was in victory. She'll always be able to remember, I had peace. Who was it? If, if it was somebody here that told me, who was it that said they, they were miserable? And so they, they started thinking, when was there a time in my life that I was truly happy? Do you all remember that story? Does anybody know? Do you know what I'm talking about? Somebody started, I should have even started telling them, I can't remember. They, they were, it may have been, a, it may have been somebody in, in a foster care situation that had been through foster care in a Christian home and they left and their life just went to nothing. And they, they asked themselves, when had I been, when was I truly happy? And they thought back when I was at that place and the Christians that were there. And it took them back to where they found God and they found favor and found peace. 
We need to be patient for a true harvest. You were talking about Jean DeVault this morning, and the people had patience with her for a true harvest. Do we have patience this evening? Are we wanting in that area? It's easy to be impatient. Another item she says is they've lost the joy of living. She said missionaries' life was not all uh, tough and hard. She said there was humor, and she told stories of, of things that were funny. But she said so many people have no sense of humor and said when there's no humor to cushion it, every rock in the roll just jars you. There's that joke about the boy that tells his grandpa that you and the mule must be the only two Christians here because of your long faces. We need to laugh and be joyful. That isn't to say be disrespectful or trite, but full of joy. You put a Russian and an Asian, a Mexican, a German, a Martian, and an Arkansan in a room and let a fat man fall and trip, and they're all going to laugh. They'll all laugh if somebody falls down. And they'll all understand each other. Laughter is universal. I heard a woman tell a story at IHC, and you all may have heard it too. She had been on her knees praying, and the Lord said, Can I have all of your children? And it became one of those situations where, Yes, Lord, you can have all of them, each one. And then he said, Can I have all of them? And I don't remember if it was that day or very soon after that she heard the knock on the door and it was a highway patrolman and her first thought was something had happened to her husband but no three of her sons had drowned that afternoon. And after the funeral and after the media and after all the things that had gone on, she and her husband and their daughter, the oldest child was gone. They'd lost three of the five. The, the, the oldest child was away from home by that point. They said, we've got to get out of here. We've got to take a little vacation. So they went somewhere to a motel and they spent that night or a few nights and, and at the motel they saw people and they just kept bumping into this couple. There and at a restaurant they'd see them and the next day at another restaurant they'd see them and, and two or three times and finally this couple come up to them and said, we've seen you time and time again. We want to ask you something. This lady says, we've been all over the news because of the tragedy. We've been on television and we assume they knew us. And we were trying to recuperate and trying to have a little time to grieve from the loss of three of our children. And this couple came up to us and said, we want to ask you, why are you so happy? Why are you so happy? There's something about the peace of God in your heart that gives you a joy. And even in the tough circumstances, you can have a joy. And the world can see it. I know that blood sugar affects your mood. I know personalities affect your mood. But we can still have joy. Smile a while and give your face a rest. As we're weighed in the balance, are we wanting in this area of levity? And lastly, obedience. Plain, old-fashioned obedience. A yes to Jesus attitude. All the time. I often tell people, I told Wayne the other day, he was talking about different churches, and, and I told Wayne, I said, I don't care what church you go to if you'll do two things. Go to any church you want to go to, but do two things. Read your Bible and obey God. And if you'll do those two things, that's all it takes. My grandmother was a lifetime of saying yes to Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. And financially, if you would look at her life, it looked like this. And right there was about the time she died. It had just been tough. God led them from that dairy farm in West Oklahoma. Nice, nice. And granddaddy got called to preach and they led them. And, and his heart's desire was to end up down in the hills around Mount Berg and Mulberry and that country. Grandmother said, yes, I'll follow, yes. And even down when she had cancer and was laying there in the hospital dying and had the trach and couldn't talk and they were suctioning it out as that cancer choked her to death. It was, yes, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad on it, she wrote on her little tablet. I wanted to farm. I wanted 
wanted cattle and country and and we've said all along the answer is yes Lord the answer is yes and the last night we had in Hercules our family sang follow follow I will follow Jesus anywhere everywhere I will follow him is that us tonight do we live in a yes to Jesus attitude are we all about obedience if it is when we're weighed in the balance will be found even. 1 John 5, 3 says it this way, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. So that's the message tonight as we weigh ourselves. Hold nothing in reserve. Live in faith, not fear. Have true love. Have a servant's heart. Be patient for a true harvest. Have joy and obey. Are we good? As we're weighed in the balance, are we wanting? We don't have to be. We can be found even. Let's stand.